Straight ahead, the 40th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and a hostage rescue gone through array. Your news starts now. Closed captioning of News Center 11 is provided by Pearl River Resort. You're watching WTOK TV, Meridian. Live from East Mississippi and West Alabama's News Leader, this is News Center 11 at 10. Well, I have this evening a local church making efforts to support one of its own. Good evening, I'm John Johnson. But first tonight, in Italy, a journalist has begun to tell the most harrowing story of her life. The journalist had been freed by her captors in Iraq and was on the way to the Baghdad airport when she came under friendly fire from the U.S. troops. The man who secured her release was killed in the incident. The Italian people and their leaders want an explanation. ABC Stephanie Sai has the story from Rome. It was supposed to be a day of celebration, not of mourning. But when the coffin of Nicola Calipari arrived in Rome, it was clear the story of his death by American gunfire would eclipse that of the hostage he helped free. Juliana Strena, a journalist who was kidnapped in Baghdad one month ago and released last Friday, wasted no time telling her version of events. All fire around me, all fire around uh, on, the, on the car, all the uh, windows broke, and it was really terrible. Skrena's eyewitness account contrasts starkly with what the American military says happened. The journalist says contrary to what the military claims, the car she was in was not speeding toward a checkpoint when U.S. soldiers opened fire. This is confirmed by the driver, uh, which is one of the survivors. The spray of bullets wounded Skrena and two others in the car. Calipari was killed instantly by a bullet to his head. Skrena says his death is far more traumatic than her kidnapping. I am not accusing the Americans. I am just saying that I can explain this fact that they shot to our car. So I, I, I want an answer. I hope that the answer can be uh, justified. U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has called his Italian counterpart to express, quote, sorrow at Calipari's death. But he shed no more light on what happened. The U.S. is promising a thorough investigation. Stephanie Sai, ABC News, Rome. Back here at home, a, a Marengo County jury has convicted one-time Alabama quarterback Michael Landrum of capital murder in the murder for hire deaths of his three-year-old daughter and her grandmother. The verdict came yesterday in Linden. 43-year-old Landrum of Sweetwater was convicted of hiring Jeffrey Napier to kill Michaela Little and 52-year-old Ida Little in August of 2003. Jurors returned Monday in the sentencing phase of the trial. The jury could recommend death or life in prison without parole. 23-year-old Napier pleaded guilty to the murders last April. He told jurors that Landrum offered him $1,000 for the killings. Well, a discussion of the Riley Education Performing Arts Center was a part of Thursday's work session. Those heading up the project addressed the Board of Supervisors on current work at the center and when the project is, is expected to be finished. Aisha Greer reports. During Thursday's supervisor work session, the executive director of the Riley Education and Performing Arts Center, Dennis Sinkovich, and MSU Meridian Dean, Dr. Harold Nichols, updated the board as to where the renovations at the site currently stand. Uh, we're under construction and rolling. Um, they are in the process right now in the Mark Rothenberg building of uh, they're putting in the steel, the new steel structure, and they're ready to start pouring floors. So that's kind of exciting. He says the current phase involves getting the structure stabilized, which will run through the summer. Then work will begin on the interior. Financially, the Riley Foundation has given an additional $2.1 million towards the project, which Nichols says will go towards upgrading the technology at the future center. It started out with the idea of doing real state of the art technology, and as the dollars got tight, the technology kind of ratcheted down, uh, and that will allow us to ratchet it back up to where we want it to be. Right. While the center will be used as a performance space, Nichols says it will also hold a valuable aspect of being a conference space as well. So we've tried to make everything as multi-purpose as we can. Um, there are conference rooms that will seat everywhere from a, a couple of hundred to uh, 20 people in the boardroom. So a variety of sizes as well to try to accommodate different kinds of markets. The hope is to also work with local schools and to offer educational programs. One of the programs we'd like to do is work with the teachers, not only in training them how to 
be a whole school, but as well as giving them opportunities and programs that the children can come down to the Riley Center and be a part of that. So the education part of the center is really about everybody in the surrounding area. When complete, officials say they expect to have 40 to 60 events in the Opera House and other studio theater space a year. The project is expected to be completed by May of 2006, and the opening date is slated for sometime in August. Aisha Greer, New Center 11. A panel in Meridian is studying the possibility of banning smoking in restaurants, bars, and other public places. The Committee of Restaurateurs, Business Owners, Residents, and Officials will meet March 22nd to analyze proposals. The committee has studied plans and has not agreed on a specific proposal. City Council Member Barbara Henson said the members could soon present a compromise before the Council for consideration. The committee is formed in December after Mayor John Robert Smith vetoed an ordinance that would have banned smoking in restaurants and other public places. All right, uh, Josh Johnson is here. You had a good Sunday, I'm pretty sure. Josh, you had a good one. Nice to see you here tonight. Good to be in. Derek and Kate taking the weekend off up in Starkville, still wrapping down the Severe Storm Symposium. Just returned from that, had a wonderful time. The weekend couldn't ask for much nicer weather. Yeah. Lots of sunshine out there, comfortable temperatures. It's getting close to spring, and the weather finally begins to act that way. We're much warmer at this time la tonight than we were this time last night. We're sitting in the middle of 40s at 45. Our dew point low, 38, but that is going to change as a very moist and warm air mass begins to move into Mississippi, and that air mass will lead to some thunderstorms throughout tomorrow. How much rain will we see and when will it end? We'll discuss it coming up in weather. All right, we'll check you out a little bit later. All right, well, today is the 40th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Political and civil rights figures were among the crowd who reenacted the march this afternoon across the bridge at Selma. The original peaceful civil rights demonstration was stopped at the bridge by law enforcement officers wielding billy clubs. Demonstrators later completed the mu pilgrimage to Montgomery. The march inspired passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Participants in today's reenactment included singer Harry Belafonte, who took part 40 years ago, Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and Linda Johnson Robb, whose father, President Johnson, s signed the law in 1965. A reenactment of the five day march to Montgomery also will take place this week, culminating the final leg through downtown Montgomery to the Capitol for a rally on Saturday. Well, coming up, efforts to support a local soldier injured in Iraq. And, and we will have the, your full weather forecast. Josh will tell us about it when we come back. Stay with us. News Center 11 at 10, brought to you by Sunbelt Motors. We're driven to be the best. News Center 11's chief meteorologist, Josh Johnson's forecast is next. Sunny skies and warm temperatures were the rule across all of East Mississippi and West Alabama today. You see the numbers, they tell the story, the high to getting up all the way into the upper 60s, very close to 70. We topped out at 69 after a morning low at 37. No rain today and only a trace so far in the, mar in the month of March, but that is soon to change over the next 24 to 36 hours. Around the deep south right now, mostly in the 40s. We're at 45, 49 in Hattiesburg, a few 50s, 52 in Mobile, 50 in Tupelo, but you can see mostly upper 40s and lower 50s across all of the twin states again at the 10 o'clock hour. Satellite radar composite imagery. We take the clouds from the satellite image, overlay it with the radar data coming out from the radars from all across the country. This gives us an excellent presentation as far as what's going on in the atmosphere. Going back to this morning, you can see some clouds much of this not reaching the ground. Again, the clouds quickly sweeping on off towards the east. And again, not, not a big deal here. Clear across much of East Mississippi and West Alabama throughout much of our Sunday. Wider perspective, you can see, here's the deal. Uh, we have a developing trough out here. You see this spin down here over Old Mexico. That's an upper air trough. And that will continue to move on off towards the east through the overnight hours tonight. That upper air trough will combine with increasing warm, moist air surging northward out of the Gulf of Mexico to kick off a round of thunderstorms as we go through the day tomorrow. The most of it coming afternoon hours into the evening hours and lasting on into Monday night. Some of the, some of the thunderstorms could be strong to severe. And of course, we'll be here all day keeping a very close eye on that and we'll pass along any updates as they become available. Around the deep south, temperatures still, you can see that warm air continuing to surge northward out of the Gulf, 63 in Houston, 56 in Baton Rouge, 
Temperatures tonight will likely not fall very much. We're sitting at 45 now. We'll likely rise a few degrees by daybreak, somewhere in the upper 40s to near 50 degrees as the sun comes up and Monday gets started. Temperatures tomorrow very nice, getting up into the 70s. But again, we'll pay the price for those warm temperatures with some showers and thunderstorms. Again, some clouds out there this morning. But again, as we went through the day, they quickly dissipated. And now we're watching thunderstorms already beginning to fire out there. Again, that trough just now beginning to enter this image out here in western Texas. Showers and storms developing along that. This will, again, continue to move on off towards the east, affecting us as we go through the evening hours tomorrow. For tonight, though, temperatures, again, slowly rising or staying steady. Our low temperature, 45 degrees, likely occurring at midnight, and then temperatures rising throughout the remainder of the evening hours. Then for tomorrow, showers and storms. Some could be strong. We'll keep an eye on it. Highs getting up into the lower 70s, near 72. Southwesterly winds gusty at times. Those gusts getting up to 30 miles an hour. Extended forecast where your weekend is always in view. Again, we pay our dues early, Monday and Tuesday. Most of the rain falling on Monday and into Monday night. And then by Tuesday, we'll see a few showers left er over early on in the day. And then we'll cool off. That front will swing through and high temperatures will be in the 50s, lows back in the 30s. And again, technically, it is still winter. So yeah. we expect these big swings like we've been seeing. But again, thunderstorms tomorrow, we'll keep a close eye on those. Continues to swing toward warmth, though. It does. Each time, these, these cold swings are not as cold, and the warm swings are a little warmer each time. So uh -huh. we're, we're heading in the right direction. No, we'll see you tomorrow, too. Oh, yeah. All right, thanks very much. Well, a local soldier injured by a roadside bomb blast in Iraq is back in the United States recovering, and support efforts are underway. George McDonald has the story. Courtney Clemens of Little Rock, Mississippi, is back in the U.S., recovering in a San Antonio hospital after being injured by a roadside bomb explosion while on duty in Iraq. He's a paramedic, and him and five more soldiers was called for a roadside accident. And when they got to the accident, they got hit by an IED, a roadside bomb. The blast killed three of the soldiers, Clemens and two others were injured. Clemens lost his right leg and severely injured his left leg. Still, his church family at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Battlefield are thankful. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. You brought him out for your protection. We feel like God has most definitely heard our prayers to have protected Courtney, but at the same time, we still want to pray for those families that lost loved ones during this same tragic event. God's got healing hands. Oh, God. The church has set up a fund at the Airport Road branch of Trustmark National Bank in Meridian and placed donation jars throughout the Collinsville area. These jars are placed in Piggly Wiggly. There's one in Union Planners Bank. And there's also one in Lucky Chisholm Tire Shop. These jars are placed there as an effort to aid the Clemens family. That will be Lois and Mitch Clemens while they're in Texas to help take care of their son. From the Battlefield community in Newton County, George McDonald, New Center 11. When we get back, we'll talk to Lauderdale County Sheriff Billy Solly and sports with Jamie Triplett. Stick with us. Welcome back. Well, Sheriff Billy Solly was our guest uh, for the program on the record this evening. We discussed overcrowding in our criminal justice systems. The circuit court docket for each of our circuit judges uh, ranges from 8 to 15 cases assigned per day. Uh, there's no way that they can have a trial for those 8 to 15 cases so, a day. So what happens to all of those, those cases? Quite often, uh, the weaker cases are those cases of uh, uh, non-violent cases, I should say. They're plea bargained. Our On the Record program can be seen every Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Well, Jamie Triplett is in this evening. Jamie, what do you have for us? Well, now? John, I can tell you this. March Madness has already started. We have Division II Baseball as West Alabama was entertaining one of his favorite guests, Delta State. And Sumter County has set the table for his neighboring teams across the state line. I have more on that. Plus, Ole Miss and South Carolina met up today in Columbia just to give you a preview of the SEC tournament. Well, on the next Good Morning Meridian, we're going to talk about something for spring breakers. Plus, I'll have a look at your full forecast. Hopefully, we'll stay on the warm side. Tune in for that and much more. Monday morning, 6 a.m., Good Morning Meridian. We'll see you. 
Welcome back. Ole Miss closed down his regular season today against the South Carolina Gamecocks, but the Rebels should take some serious notes. The same two teams will match up again four days later in Game 1 of the SEC Tournament in Atlanta. When that happens, it will be the third time in the last four years. In the first, Kendrick Fox nails the three from up top. The Rebels led 25-14. Still in the first, same score, Todd Abernathy shakes and goes in strong for the lay-in. Rebels led by 13. But Carlos Powell had something to say about that on senior day as he gets the turnaround kisser off the glass. Powell scored a career-high 30 points as South Carolina rallied from a 14-point first-half deficit to beat Ole Miss 76-70 to in overtime. Alabama's players couldn't forget watching Mississippi State come to Tuscaloosa last season and clinch the SEC West. Given a chance at redemption, they turned the table on the Bulldogs. Kennedy Winston had 21 points, and the Crimson Tide wrapped up the division title with a 68-63 victory over the Bulldogs on Saturday in the Mississippi State's worst shooting game in four years. All-American Lawrence Roberts led State with 15 points and 11 rebounds. The Bulldogs are placing the third seed out of the West, for the SEC tournament in Atlanta on Thursday. They will face East number six seed Georgia at 2.15 p.m. For the first time this season, Illinois has the bounce back from a loss. Ohio State Reserve forward Matt Sylvester hit a three-pointer with 5.1 seconds left today to hand the top-ranked Illini their first defeat, 65-64. The Illini were trying to cap the Big Ten's first unbeaten season in 29 years. Instead, they frittered uh, frittered away a 12-point lead in the second half and didn't score over the final three minutes. The last team to reach the NCAA tournament without a loss was UNLV in 1991. Going to your scoreboard for tonight, the Gators upset the third-ranked Wildcats 53-52 on Sunday. North Carolina got a 75-73 victory over their nemesis, Duke. And Delta State fell to Montevallo in the Gulf South Championship 72-60. Normally when you mention the word gold digger, it really has a derogatory meaning. But when you mention that same word in March around basketball time, that is a title that any team would love to have. The Suffolk County boys basketball team are gold diggers once again as they repeated as 3A state champions with a 76-60 victory over Central Hainville. It was the sixth state title for Suffolk County, but the first since longtime coach Johnny Patrick retired after last year's season, also a championship year. New coach? Different year, same result. With 13 years under Patrick's belt as an assistant, head coach Alonzo Sledge showed those veteran qualities over the Lions. Sledge isn't new to coaching, but he is new to winning a championship. Basically, the game went, you know, went the way that we, you know, pretty much expected if we was able to get off to a good start and kind of control the tempo of the game and play the style of game that we, that we are, you know, familiar with, the one, the one that side that we play better. Felt good. My last year, just wanted to go all out. We carrying on the school tradition. Then we doing it. We just got a new coach still one. So I think that means a lot. There was a message in Saturday night's game between Newton and Perry Central. There are four quarters in high school basketball. In a frantic finish, the Lady Tigers held off Perry Central 64-61 at the Mississippi Coliseum to advance to the girls' 2A state championship game on Friday. But it could have been a different and sad story for Newton. Hey, Coach Crandall Porter and his girls had a 13-point lead over Perry Central for first three periods, only to see it dwindle to four in the fourth. Injured junior guard Chasani Henderson gave the much-needed charge to Newton to overcome the Lady Bulldogs. Henderson vowed to be ready for the championship. Going to your John O'Neill Johnson Toyota Sports Poll question, the question was, who should be Atlanta's opening day starter? 70% said John Smoltz, 23% voted Tim Hudson. Now for the new question. What basketball topic are you most interested in this time of the year? High school playoffs, conference tournaments, or the college bubble teams? To vote, go to WTOK.com and click on sports. Make your selection and we will have the results Wednesday at 6. And when you think about two nationally ranked teams just 35 miles down the road, the first thing you may want to ask is, what bus are they on and which way are they going? Well, that wasn't the case today as 16-ranked West Alabama was hosting Delta State, the second-ranked team in Division II baseball. The Tigers and the Statesman came in today with a 1-1 split. Who would win the series? In the top of the six, DSU up 1-0, man on second, Craig Newton. Here's a scribbler to right field to score Brett Donahue. The fighting Oprah extended its lead by two. Still in the sixth, a man on first and third for Delta State. Two men out. 
a two and two count for Matt Chambliss. He strikes out Eric Patton to end the threat and the inning, but could West Alabama get it going? Bottom of the six, man on second. The John Poles pitch gets away from the catcher Craig Newton, but he makes the nice play at first to end the inning. It wasn't 11 runs like game two Saturday night. More of a pitcher's duel as Delta State outlast UWA 3-1. to one. Going to your college scoreboard for tonight, the Rebels got two home runs from Zach Cozart in a 13-6 victory over the Boilermakers to sweep the series. MSU beat Kansas 9-2 behind a homer and five RBIs from Thomas Berkery. The Tide put up 23 runs to defeat the Mini State Cowboys 23-1. And Southern Miss scored three runs in the top of the 10th inning to claim a 5-2 victory over Lamar. To the fishing game forecast from Cuba Timber, Monday should provide an excellent day to fish or hunt. If you're headed to the woods or water, expect the best action between 3.30 and 10 p.m. There should be also good activity around 9.45 a.m. And, John, do you know what week this is? Uh, I, I don't know, but I think you're going to tell me. Well, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a full basketball week of playoffs. Yeah. Hopefully our teams will do well in our viewing area. It's March and people are mad. Yes, they are. All right, <laughs> thanks very much. All right, when we come back, a family in need gets a hand from Extreme Makeover. And Charles, uh, sorry, Josh will be here with tomorrow's forecast. Stay with us. The Fish and Game Forecast is brought to you by Cuba Timber. Well, the ABC program, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition, had some familiar faces this evening. The Harris Sextuplets from Birmingham, Chris and Diamond Harris, are grateful for the ultimate makeover of their home. In fact, any help with their toddler sextuplets and nine-year-old son, Dwayne, is appreciated. Diamond is, of course, from Meridian. She's a Meridian native, and Chris is from Yankee, Alabama, West Alabama. Their 2,000-square-foot, three-bedroom home was in desperate need of repair, and matters were made worse when Hurricane Ivan sent a tree crashing through the living room. Well, the Harris sextuplets, four boys and two girls, are two years old. The family took a Disney vacation while the circus, a circus full of clowns helped to redo their home. The Extreme Makeover Home Edition team got busy to help the Harris family with its home, ad home problems, and the finished product was revealed tonight. The Harris Toddlers are America's only surviving African-American sex toddlers. And boy, what a beautiful home that is. And uh, they are home folks. They're from us, from my area. You love to hear stuff like you that. You do. That's All good right. stuff. Unfortunately, uh, the, new, the new house is going to see some rain tomorrow. And we are too. But the rest of the night looking all right. The early riding forecast brought to you by Meridian Cycles. We'll see clouds increasing and our temperature. Any help with their toddler sex tuplets and nine-year-old son Dwayne is appreciated. Diamond is, of course, from Meridian. She's a Meridian native, and Chris is from Yankee, Alabama, West Alabama. Their 2,000-square-foot, three-bedroom home was in desperate need of repair, and matters were made worse when Hurricane Ivan sent a tree crashing through the living room. Well, the Harris sex tuplets, four boys and two girls, are two years old. The family took a Disney vacation while the circus, a circus full of clowns helped to redo their home. The Extreme Makeover Home Edition team got busy to help the Harris family with its home, ad home problems, and the finished product was revealed tonight. The Harris toddlers are America's only surviving African-American sex toddlers. And boy, what a beautiful home that is, and uh, they are home folks. They're from us, from my area. You love to hear stuff like you do. that. That's All good right. stuff. Unfortunately, uh, the, new, the new house is going to see some rain tomorrow, and we are too, but the rest of the night looking all right. The early riding forecast brought to you by Meridian Cycles. We'll see clouds. Increasing and our temperature also going in the wrong direction. We're 45 now, we'll be 49 by tomorrow. Rain moving in, especially in the afternoon hours, thunderstorms becoming likely. All right, thank you very much. We thank you for being with us, and uh, we will see you tomorrow morning, or some of us will, and, and uh, we'll also see you tomorrow night. Have a good evening, we'll see you later.